All right. Uh, welcome to Vegan World 2026 Collective Intelligence. Benjamin and Suzanne, please kick us off with an update from the street, and then we'll talk about bringing together the three perspectives, the new Occupy, SRM, and veganism. Take it away, Benjamin and Suzanne. Hi. Hey, everyone. Uh, quick update from the Portland, Oregon area. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has only grown. Uh, we've been attending the protests that are on the east side of the town. There's multiple protests happening in this area, like um, almost neighborhood by neighborhood, depending on how um, many people want to participate in a protest where social distancing is difficult versus a protest where social distancing is not difficult. Um, there are family friendly ones, there are pet friendly ones, there's, um, it's, it's been really interesting. There are two really large protests happening in Portland. One of them is kind of trying to keep the police on their toes. It's um, supported and organized by the Black Lives Matter movement. And then there's another, another group that's protesting at the Justice Center. Um, and I think they're getting hit a little harder in terms of the uh, um, the tear gas, the uh, pepper spray, um, general police violence. Um, and there's there is a call to bring both both protests together, um, as well as some arguments as to which one is more effective, why we would be doing one versus the other. Um, and that's been a really interesting conversation um, that I don't really know a lot about and can't really share much on. But um, yesterday, really cool moment, we spontaneously shut down the uh, one of the largest interstate freeways. Is it, sorry, not interstate, it's a, it's, it's a 405, so you know it goes around it wasn't four oh five. Was it not four? Oh, it was eighty four. Is yeah. east west. Yeah. Um. And it was incredible. It we uh, I don't know. Maybe it was a half a mile of stretch. Maybe a little longer of highway. We shut down. We shut down both sides. There were cars blocking. Um, non. Non government. Like no, there were no police involved in any of this because I don't think they knew where we were going in advance. Um, and it was really incredible to see all of us spread out on the highway, chanting, singing songs. There were cars with megaphones and speaker systems that um, were engaging people. And generally, it, we haven't, we, Suzanne and I have not stayed too late in, in all of this. Um, however, we've been debating thing later we might stay later tonight. We don't really know what we're going to be doing um, or how dangerous it is. Um, there are definitely people who are engaging in much more dangerous um, activities than we are, that's for sure. And, you know, there it's, it's kind of crazy. Every time we do it, there are multiple moments where I could just find myself breaking down in tears, just totally losing myself because everybody is so united and it's incredibly powerful. The other day we went through um, a residential neighborhood as opposed to kind of a commercial like downtown area. And there were so many families and kids and elderly people out on their porches, you know, with their fists up in the air with, um, posters and yeah it was it's just it's really moving and I'm really excited that they're like we've been finding out today I think there's been some progress that's that's being made in Minneapolis and um, our our police chief has resigned and um, made place for a black police chief who's I think he just took office yesterday. Um, so that's, that's some progress there. However, 
it's not exactly what we're going after. I think it depends on who you talk to, what the um, the best solution to all of this is, and I don't claim to know what the best thing to do in right now is. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's what's been going on. You know, <laughs> it's been it's this is unlike anything I've ever experienced, and I don't think. I don't think we're going to stop anytime soon. Wow. Wow. Thank you. So beautiful. So inspiring. And I'm just so happy we can kind of live it vicariously uh, through you guys. So thanks so much for having a, a foot in both worlds. Um, and, uh, I see Emery's, Emery's got his hand up. Go for it, Emery. Yeah, I just had a question for Benjamin. What was the ultimate objective uh, uh, again? The ultimate object objective um, for these particular protests, I think it's to raise awareness um, as well as call for the, the entire reform of the I would it's say defunding. defund it's, the police. It's is, is essentially the, defunding the police, yeah. And investing in community services and mental health services and food, you know, all, all sorts of community services. Everything that's like could prevent all of this from happening in the first place that we don't right. spend money on and we, we rely on the police to do in, in retro. Why would, you def why would you defund the police? Um, they've essentially been militarized over the past few decades and um, like we said we believe that the money can be better spent providing community services rather than um, a, a militarized police that, that doesn't protect all of its citizens are the police, are the police a part of the community? They aren't typically fully representative of the communities that they are protecting. So they, they live apart from the community? I think it depends. Well, and, and so that is one of the other calls in defunding the police. It's to promote um, more community safety measures too. Not, not just community services, but um, like community watch programs and, and those types of programs. So, so yeah, yeah, they would be deput deputized uh, community, people in the community would be dep deputized to watch over the community, which the police are now uh, like defunded to to certain extent so they're like i'm just trying to understand what you're trying to accomplish by defunding the police who are you know they're human beings like anyone else i don't think they're robots yet and they're trying to do a job to protect uh, those that are in need of protection um, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of variations of judgment calls in different, uh, variety of situations, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I guess these, these human beings, police, they have to operate somehow with some kind of funding. But I mean, if we're, if we're going towards a cashless society anyway, then maybe they don't need funding. Maybe they should just do it uh, out of the goodness of their hearts. I don't know. But uh, maybe they're lacking hearts because they're killing too many people. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, police police have, have been trained. I think there's a certain degree of, uh, of um, there's an element of not doing things properly in, in the training process, you know where, you know, they're trained to, to kill people, you know, instead of, instead of restraining people, you know, 
without necessarily killing them. It always seems to be like a kill shot. And that has a lot to do with their training. And the training is provided by those in society, in the community, okay? I think, I think there has to be a reorganization of how these police operate in, in the community and in general, you know? And irregardless of their equipment, right? They may have militarized equipment, but that equipment is collecting dust anyways, you know? So I don't see any of them. I don't see any of the police, uh, you know, using tanks down the street like the, they've done in China. They, they absolutely are. are. They are using Are tanks. they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think if you uh, if you look at uh, there's a, a CNN report over the weekend there and um, they showed uh, an interview with Trump back in the time of that time back in the when the troubles were in China and the Tiananmen Square situation uh, occurred and so the a reporter uh, that was interviewing Trump at the time asked him what he thought of that and he said he he was I think he was the only one on the planet that looked Actually, turned around and said that he um, he would congratulate the, the Chinese for for the right approach because that's the way to approach it. They, they did the right thing, roll right over them and keep them. That you have to keep the people, or, or you have to um, dominate the situation that way and and put an end to it straight away. And they, that he was he was in favour of what the Chinese did. In other words, I think he was the only one on the planet that was. So that just give you an idea. Like, um, they're capable of doing anything. The idea of defunding the police, it may be an incentive to make the police wake up and everything else, but if you defund the police and it leads to a lack of a police force, then you're left with self-policing. And when you're left with self-policing, them, as Emery said, without the training, you end up with a situation of Valanti, or Valanti, Valanti, or Valanti. Or can't Vigilante. Even say what, no. Vigilante. Vigilante. Yeah, you end up with vigilantism, and then you have all sorts of issues arise and all that. So th the problem is plain and simple. It's down to the racism, and it's down to the powers that be and the laws that are written to protect that racism. It just has to be eradicated, and and anyone and and police forces just can't simply just can't protect their own. It's not about them protecting their own. They're out there. It's about them protecting the people on the street who they're being hired to do or protect. Like so, you know, it, it's just a matter of enforcing the law. And and personally, I, I it's a, it's an up a very you know a very steep uphill battle. I think you have on your hands. I think it's a it's a situation of too much violence on the planet. You know, the violence is what is ruling the actions of too many people on the planet. Violence, violence, violence. It's in the games, it's on the TV, it's, it's in the interactions, it's uh, the win-win mentality that people have. It's winning at all costs. It's violent. I'm telling you, it's the violence, you know? From the moment you're born, you come out in a violent way, okay? They slap you to, to, uh, to breathe. It's a violent process. All right. Speaking of violence, uh, Ray has his hand up. Uh, go for it, Ray. One of the things that the defund the police is about is that uh, there's so many parts of our society where the police are implicit. And really we're, we're training people with guns and violent methods to solve almost everything in our society. So if any phone call to the police, uh, there's really no nuance to it. You get a call, you get somebody who's, who's trained to kill to show up at your house to deal with every pro whatever problem you have. And that's been a system that, you know, it's, it's nice and simple for people to understand. It's nice and simple for people to fund. We respond to fear. 
we get told that if we don't uh, increase the police force, then we're going to have people crawling through our windows and stealing our stuff. So, um, are they though? You know, it's there's a level of crime, and that we we're not saying get rid of the police. We're just saying that that, that uh, we've kind of fallen into a, a system by which um, everything is considered a crime. And when it comes down to it, every cop. Apparently, the, the average is that they make one uh, felony arrest a year. So we're, we're hiring somebody a full salary to do one felony arrest a year, and then the rest of the year they're finding, you know, little things to keep occupied. And a huge part of that is to arrest black people. Find black people, arrest them. And that is their modus operandi. And if everybody's okay with that, we continue with our society. But I think we've gotten to the point where we're not anymore. We've also seen it in Toronto too. You know, you're talking about finding things to do. We're we're doing protests, you know, uh, and and we're obviously peaceful. And we've had like 20 cops show up while we're stopping a chicken truck. You know, and like, why do we need 20 cops there? You know, I guess they have nothing to do, right? You know, so um, so you're talking about uh, yeah, like. They don't even know what to do then. They don't even know the laws. They're just like, they're, they're told to, to show up. We know our laws. So, you know, we have people there that, that know how to respond and we're allowed to do this, quoting laws and, you know, tell us where we can't do this because, you know, and, and they don't even know it. They're, they're just there to basically bully us away because we're annoying. You, you know, typically, typically, uh, and it's normal uh, that, uh, during the hiring process of police, okay, they choose those with low IQs, okay, those that can be manipulated to follow instructions and orders and procedure. So, you know, I'm not surprised, but there are some very good police and I don't think it's a good idea to lump all of those together, you know, into, uh, you know, and paint everyone who is trying to make uh, the world a better, safer place, you know, with the same paintbrush. Uh, there are very corrupt police and, um, you know, those that are in charge um, as, you know, evidenced by the by what's you know occurred in recent memory with the Comey and the and the all the uh, the people that are now facing uh, you know serious serious situations with the judiciary there so I mean everybody's gonna meet with their just reward you know or or penalty for what they've done that that cop that uh, put uh, Floyd down, you know, he's going to pay for what he did, right? And, but doesn't, doesn't it pain you to, to see that there's so much suffering uh, as a consequence of people getting out of order and just destroying willy-nilly people's work, hard work, and, you know, disrupting life for people i mean that that tends to make things a lot worse so you know i'm i hate seeing that in society but you know that's why there needs to be some control i mean not everybody's working with a full a full load in their head you know to destroy property and to put people's lives in danger, you know, that's not a good situation. Can I, can I say something real quick? Um, unfortunately, there are a few of, uh, okay. Maybe I'm not, uh, th there's a lot to respond to in what you just said, Amory, and I'd love to have a deeper discussion with you about this. Um, we have personally witnessed the 
instigation of violence from the police, um, not not from looters or rioters or 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 these peaceful protesters. Um, the goal of these protests aren't to destroy property either, and even if that is a consequence, um, how how many dollars are you willing to put on a person's life uh, when you know they're systematically th killed? Yeah, it just doesn't. It it's um, I understand like. I'm not going out there with the intention of destroying any property and I'm not doing that. And there, there are thousands and thousands of people who are deciding not to do that as well. Um, I don't know how much of the information that is being put out there by the news and the internet is true in terms of what looting and whatnot um, was and, and started why, and, and why. why they're focusing on that. And why that's being focused instead on. Instead of there's very, very little looting um, happening here in Portland. Um, there are businesses that are boarding up. And I think the first few days of protests were, were much different than, than what's like things have definitely settled down. And I think part of that is because people didn't really know how to react to any of this. Um, and we, we have to get yeah, going. We have, we have to get going. So we're going to listen while we get out the door. Um, but thank you all. Yeah. We're gonna jump off video and stuff. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Great to see well, you. Mm -hmm. I would just like to say in response to that anyway, is that uh, something Guy McPherson said there last week, if you want to know the world, what, what the news is really like, what the news is re of what's really going on in America is like, look at the news that's outside America. You know, what's on the news channels outside America. I'm here living in Europe. I, I watch the European news channels. And we're, we're watching it very closely, what's going on in America, because, you know, it's crazy. And um, we're, we're doing it from a, a unique point of view, because in America, you, you've got two political parties who are treating each other like direct enemies, which is the problem in itself. It's no longer just political rivalry, it's enemies. That's what they're treating each other as. And it's no matter what one says, the other are born to agree with it. And there's one big problem anyway in yourself. You're already divided in that sense. And it's your political leaders that have divided you. And it's your leader, your president, who's, really, who's now shoved in the biggest wedge of all. And he's standing and stamping on that wedge as hard as he can now to divide his whole country. For whatever reasons he wants to do that, I'm not even going to speculate, but that's what the outside world can see happening. That man is splitting your country in half. And I, you have to wake up and realize it and get together to stop it. But the point is, the racism is, is, the, is the key issue at the moment. And as for regards to looting, all we can see in European news channels is that there may be sporadic outbreaks of looting here and there where people will take advantage of a situation but the main the main focus and seems to be in the is that the focus is for justice for floyd and for black uh, black uh, lives matter and the key issues and that's that's what seems to be the point and what we see uh, from the outside world is a, a democratic society which both both political establishments always base their, um, you know, the whole uh, political system is based on democracy, regardless of whether it's Republican against Democrats from the beginning. It's still a democratic society. But what we see is it's slowly becoming a totalitarian fucking society. You're, 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 that's the way Trump seems to be going on, as far as I'm concerned, and that's far as, uh, and with Europeans viewing it as well. So I wouldn't take too much notice of the looting. That's just a sad element of, of, of parts of people who can see that there's a bigger picture. There's always going to be elements like that. But the majority of the people, as far as the world can see, and that's why there are out protests in, in solidarity, which is that you're, you're protesting for the right reasons. The racism has to stop, simple and plain. And the powers that be have to either 
step out of the way and let somebody else take over so that the right laws are implemented and enforced and that anyone in the, even in law enforcement that breaks those laws is treated as equally as any man on the street that's as simple as that over here in ireland we have police force they don't have guns and they have to go to study for a number of years uh, before they graduate as police uh, uh, you know we call them guards here as they before they graduate as a police officer and uh, go on the streets and they're trained in psychology and all sorts of everything else but they don't go on the streets with any guns simple as that and you have a different situation because guns have always been in your uh, culture so that's something that you have to uh, work around for the future as far as i'm concerned but it's not an issue here no the issue is the racism and that's the root of your problem and the main root of your problem now at the moment is the the person standing on the wedge and for, forcing your country apart that's the way see it, and that's the way the world on the outside is looking at it too just uh make makes it easy to blame the trumpster uh james we're gonna have to talk privately at some point like i said to emory already we've had that discussion man i can't convince you for reasons which satisfy me no more than you can convince me for reasons which satisfy you all i, I can say i'll agree to differ with you on that one or i as far as i'm concerned i think the majority of the world the majority of the world barring barring only a, a small number of Republican people who are supporting Trump are the only ones who are supporting Trump. I think I'll, I'll give it a try to convince you because there are things you just don't know. Well, I don't think you're aware of what I know completely uh, in, in the sense that, Emery, but, uh, you know, I'm willing to debate it with you, but I don't think we've come to any consensus or agreement on that one anyway, I don't think. You know, some sometimes uh, sometimes you just, you know, as I said, can't convince anybody for the for the reasons that they believe and then you know what I mean. Well, we're on the same team over here, collective intelligence, but you know, we don't have well, to see every we don't have to see every color, you know, or every shade or every every moment of everybody's life but i'm gonna try with you because i feel it's important enough not here but in the future i'll i'll, I'll reach out to you fair enough Henry. okay great moments in zoom conferencing we're gonna talk it out Look at. <laughs> I'm not quite clear on what what you don't see eye to eye on. Um, I want to to uh, ring in on that idea of uh, of the violence that's being caused to um, in the rioting and the in the looting. Because there's there's something James said that about uh, that that we have to make the rules equal for every man, but we. No, recognize that there, our society is racist and that we don't have equality between each man. So when there's looting happening, and, and I'm not trying to convince anybody to say that they should think looting is right. I'm trying to put it into context so it can be understood in an activist sense that uh, maybe beyond the radical level you're comfortable with, but to try, if you're really trying to understand the mindset of the people that are doing this, uh, a lot of them are targeting banks and uh, Macy's and big corporations. How many Macy's are worth one black man's life? And if we start to play that game, it's a, a bit of what, uh, what Benjamin said earlier, that uh, when you talk about damaged property, you're now talking about dollar bills, and you're talking about the system that is precisely the mechanisms of, of pushing black people down the corporate state is uh you know we have police protecting corporations not protecting people correct protecting corporations they'll show up with riot gear to say that they're protecting protesters and we get that a lot in toronto we get uh police showing up and saying we're here to protect you and then they boss us around and tell us to move around and act real real tough because they're you know they have the authority to to move us around 
but ultimately they're they're telling their, us that they're there to protect us so in one case there was a, a pig truck that rolled over and a bunch of pigs there's 150 pigs on this truck and uh, they were protecting the uh, the uh, company the the slaughterhouse that was nearby the police were helping hide the uh, the pigs as they were being marched off to their slaughter I, I don't understand how that's serving and protecting me and then some activists crossed the line and they got arrested so you know that was for the sake of a corporation do you want your police to be uh, representing corporations or do you want them to serve and protect human beings and if, and if uh, you know, well, you cross the line, you cross the police tape, you obviously uh, deserve to get arrested. In this case, it was activists that said, I'm gonna get arrested because I don't think that this is uh, justice being served. So breaking laws is one way of, of saying that uh, the laws are not just and they're not serving me. There was a woman on uh, uh, John Oliver last week tonight, the very end of, of the latest episode, and she said that um, there's a contract between the police and, and, and society that when there's violence, they come and they solve it. When they come and they cause violence, that contract is broken. So when the contract is broken, how do you respond? And in that case, that there was uh, apparently the looting of a Macy's nearby. Uh, there was a football stadium and, and, uh, or something. A football hall of fame. Yeah. Um, so something was, some property was damaged. And uh, like I said, I'm not trying to convince anybody that, that uh, they should be pro-looting um, and pro-rioting, pro-violence in any way. I'm just explaining it from the standpoint of under understanding what the objective is. It is, I feel, distracting from, the, from uh, George Floyd in the first place, and, and it gives, you know, Fox News and the people who would rather just uh, pretend there's no problem to be solved to say, oh, look, look, people are causing violence now. I don't approve of this methodology. So it's not whether I approve of this method methodology, it's whether I recognize it and understand what's going on. And there is a contract between uh, the people who hire the police and the people who, uh, and the police when they respond to uh, to situations and when they show up in you know armored vehicles and uh, armed to the teeth with military weapons what sort of problem were they planning on solving were they were they negotiating teams is Trump calling for negotiating teams or is he decided that violence is uh, his tool and that's the the voice of his administration is to just solve everything with violence well, it's an economy. The whole economy is is works with with violence and control. You know, it was built on slavery. Well, the, the guns, the everything, anything that you can think of. Okay, but I mean, behind any tool, okay, there's a human being. Okay, there's an individual. There's a person in charge with a brain okay and that brain has been has been uh kaput. In, most, in most cases it's been kaput okay and they make decisions irrational decisions okay and violent violence is a, is the re end result and death and harming harming people Okay, so, you know, and the tools are there, the equipment is there, that's the economy, people make money off of it, okay, it's a big business, it's a nasty, dirty, violent business that's going on, you know, and... Uh, well, Macy's is violent, it, Macy's is a, a company that is, is uh, grown and has thrived on violence. Yeah, but to, you know, the, the, the society of the, violence, and then uh, people are saying, "Well, I, I don't, I don't like what's going on here." Yeah, but we society, don't like anything. Society supports it. They shop, 
People shop, people buy, people want, people want the best deal in town. They they'll go, they'll go miles for a good deal, you know, to save a few bucks because they're their the, the foot is down on their head, you know. They're working three jobs to make ends meet, you know. It, it, it's terrible. The, the whole thing is a manipulated thing that, that's going on. And, you know, it's a distraction also because, you know, we, we are facing much more severe problems on this planet, okay. And animals and left, right, and center are dying. Extinctions have occurring all around us. And, you know, we're, we can't seem to focus. We're losing focus on, on greater, more important things that, that need to be done in the world, okay? And, uh, the, and I'm not even touching the nuclear business, okay? Those nuclear facilities, it takes 65 years to shut them down. Okay, nobody's, nobody's moving a finger. Okay, let's just build more of them. Let's just have more Fukushima's. And, and you know, the planet's heating up uh, every single second. So, you know, all these things that we're talking about here, it's a, it's a distraction for sure. And Floyd, you know, the, you know he was a criminal. You know, they gave, they gave him what, a, a, a salute to, to his funeral? A salute? Look at all the uh, people that died for for uh, uh, for the country, and a lot of a lot of uh, people, uh, you know, more deserving of a salute. Okay. Well, do, you, do you think that, that, that George Floyd got uh, a, a proper justice? Do you think that he, as a criminal, his uh, judge, jury, and executioner um, ex well, performed take justice? Take it to the court. Uh, get the guy responsible. It's that guy. The guy had his knee on yeah. his neck. If you ask Floyd George if he could go, would go to court. I'm sure he'd be happy to. It's better than the what, the yeah, alternative. But it's too late now. It's too late now. Everything is everything has been done. All right. You brought it to an interesting point where we were talking about the foundation of society is pretty shitty to begin with, and why should we expect any better? So maybe that's a good segue into uh, talking about how do we change the the foundation of society so that we're not, you know, fighting for survival. And uh, a lot of the corporations, the, the system that we have right now is about making us fight for, you know, claw each other even from every level of society to, uh, you know, fight for that interest rate on our money. And uh, you don't deserve to be on this planet until you have a job, until you, you know, present your your usefulness to society why can't i live on this planet why don't i not belong here is there somebody that i have to jump through hoops for before somebody decides that I, that i'm an earthling and that fits right into the, the movie earthling and uh, the idea that animals belong here too we're all earthlings so uh, let's build a foundation that says you belong here that's I mean, how much is all that's all it's all uh, you know the uh, countries that want to go to war against each other because they, you know, the, the, there's not room enough on the planet for, for, for two different uh, faiths, that uh, there's a holy line that, that both have to occupy. Everybody belongs here, so why can't we start with that foundation? And uh, that means getting rid of a lot of this, this uh, stuff that we're just so used to, We've, we call it normal. And that <laughs> includes the police. We have to rethink what, what uh, responding to, um, like I said, what, police have one felony charge a year. We have the illusion that they go out there and they're stopping murders left and right and they're solving crimes. If they don't solve the crime within uh, 48 hours, they're not going to solve it at all. So they're just uh, you know going through the motions of a lot of a lot of things that that don't really matter that that uh, we're told are really you know, performing a, a, a service. Uh, but ultimately, in the end, we're, we're training people with guns to solve problems. And then people get shot. And then we go wonder why. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, where, that's, that's it. It's a training. 
you know it's a training and and you know these these people that, that take on that occupation okay they wear a uniform okay and the society's been trained you know to see that as the authority above their head so you know it's all training everybody gets a lot of training right but whether it's the good training and to what what end what to what end is that training provided what is what is what is to be accomplished by any specific training that is being put out there you know that's the question and uh um, why they're saying defund the police and start funding people who talk to people and, and solve problems with their voices and with their reason now with their billy clubs etc I, I wouldn't go to that extreme to defund to defund anything but uh you know certainly we have to rewire the brain well, the brains are, you know, our brains are what are, <laughs> we know what we know and we're, we're born into the society that we have. Can we reject the society that we have and build something better? And uh, we've got, a, as activists, we've got around us people that really believe in that old system. And they believe, even the stuff they don't like, they, they still believe in it because it's, some, it's the evil that they know. And they really don't believe that we change, we change every decade. You know, we have things called the 80s, the 90s, you know, the 70s, the 60s, the 40s. All of it means something different to us. So who's, who says we don't change? We're constantly changing. And our society adapts to um, either where we want it to go, which is called revolution, or, you know, or just goes by um, industry and, and uh, greed and all the elements that have, uh, you know, hijacked our democracy. We think we have democracy, but I can't see any evidence of it. So wouldn't we like a universal basic income where we know that, that, that people belong on the planet and we will make sure that nobody starves to death? Not in this country, not in any other country. So we start with that and universal basic nutrition, universal basic um, shelter. We have, you know, six times as many houses as there are homes homeless people, empty houses, then there are homeless people. So, you know, can we give somebody a house? Well, you can't get just give somebody a house because that doesn't fit into the paradigm that my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents learned from the industrial revolution. We're not in the industrial revolution, so it's a good time to move on. No, uh, let's, and that's no, part no, of what sailors, we need to do. What is this new revolution we want? Well, let's say let's uh, start it off by giving everybody a meal. So, you know, let's start there and worry about the house later. Yeah, yeah. You, My you right. your stomach and then you get their ears, right? They'll listen. All right. My, uh, really great conversation, you guys. Myra's had her hand up for a bit. Uh, just wanted to give her an opportunity. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that I have to go and cook dinner for my family. And regarding all this George Floyd situation, I don't think that this is an issue that has to do with culture, race, color of our skin. This is a consciousness issue. And we had this issue for thousands of years. Um, consciousness a good state of consciousness starts in the family because as we are born we are not born with prejudice we are not born with division we there's no future for us there's no past for us we are in the now and today we are in the present from the day that we are born um, the, I think that the issue starts uh, the way society is, the way our parents start raising us. So uh, assisting to George Floyd's um, protesting, it's, it's just one step. It's one step towards recognizing that we are one. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what race, what religion you are. 
So I think that everybody is doing the right things. Everything is in the right, perfect situation as it is right now. And there is going to be more of this. Um, and I think that the cosmos and, and the divine superior intelligence is just doing the right thing for us to, in the near future, become as one in everything, one in our ancestral mother, one in, in, in humanity. So I definitely support I don't care who was George McCloy, um, not McCloy, I'm giving him a last thing. <laughs> I don't care who he is. What I care is to see how now humanity is fighting for their rights and what they think is right. So if, if he was the criminal, if he wasn't, you know what? At the end of his life, when he was taking his last breath, he asked for his mother. And that is so meaningful to me because it's heartbreaking to me because at the end, this is who we ask for. We ask for our mother and we ask for that divine consciousness, which is very more similar to the love. We know that God is love. So I highly believe that every day we come to a more um, near future where humanity is going to be concerned about not only Black Lives Matters, but just that every life matters, no matter what. So yes, I do support in every aspect. I support the protestings going on. If I could be there, I would, but I can't. <laughs> um, but here in this scenario, we have a lot more to be working on. More than Black Lives Matters, we have to be working into healing Mother Earth, making a vegan world soon, and cooling down the oceans for our Mother Earth. So just wanted to say that we have to be focused. We are in a different dimension than a lot of other people because at the end, we're all going to become vegan. We have a vegan heart, like Silej always says. So we have to be focused on that and we cannot let ourselves get distracted by what other people are doing also. With that, I'm sorry, I like to say good night everybody. Hope you guys all have a blessing rest of the day and I hope to see you guys all tomorrow with the speech with Guy McPherson speaking with yogis. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Uh, regarding that speech because I don't know what uh, what's going to be the outcome regarding Guy McPherson. Um, my intention over that is to have Guy spread more love than hopeless within humanity. It scares me a lot to see the messages of hopeless, to see the messages telling people that the world is going to end, that we are in the human seventh mass extinction because not a lot of people are strong in their consciousness and it, it freaks me out to know that because there's a lot of people that are very weak that they're going to start having a lot of emotional problems and they can start doing things that are not right so um, this is a reason why I invited Guy McPherson to speak with yogis and when I say yogis I am guided by the Bhagavad Vajita book, which yogi is definitely not one who practices yoga. It's one who has a very high state of consciousness that they, uh, they are more into the vibration of love and hope. And um, yeah, so hope to see you guys all there and we'll see what the outcome comes out of that amazing dialogue that we're going to have with him. So thank you all. It was nice to see you guys. <laughs> see you guys all on Friday and tomorrow. Thank you, Myra. Thanks, Myra. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks. You know, um, 
I don't see that anyone's in the queue at the moment. Um, so I'd like to just step in and comment that, um, you know, as, uh, you know, as I see that there's so many different priorities and so many different projects that we could be working on, you know, where to put the focus, right? And um, one answer that I've, you know, come up with is the answer nowhere. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that just imagine that there is this thriving collective intelligence that spans every imaginable topic, right? And people literally just go where they're called. And in the process, they may say, hey, you know, I'm seeing that, you know, this used to be meaningful to me before, but now this other thing is calling to me, fine, change lanes, go over to wherever it's, it's most meaningful. So rather than try to force some consensus upon, you know, any particular community, um, you know, how about simply letting a gazillion flowers bloom and everyone will go where they, you know, where it makes sense for them to go or where they're called to go. Um, I, I, you know, then the reason I mention that is because just, just look at this really interesting intersection tonight where you've got Benjamin, Suzanne, who normally would be here, but they're off at protests because that's what they're called to do right now. Silish is, is, you know, very, very focused on, on veganism and now an expanded focus to feeding everyone. Right. Um, my focus, you know, I don't know, a year and a half ago was SRM. Now it's, feeding everyone and SRM and collective super intelligence. And so, you know, how do we, you know, how do we figure this whole thing out? It would be, it would be kind of nice if we all agreed on exactly what to do next for a second and third, et cetera. But the reality I'm seeing here is that um, there is a lot of divergence. And what if we simply embrace that and focus instead on the actual collective superintelligence itself, the structure, the framework, the systems, the software, the community, the rules, et cetera. Because once we have that really efficient network that can connect us and help us sort out collectively what the priorities are, right? Um, you know, once we have that really well working marketplace of ideas and of conversations and, you know, radical inclusivity and ease of basically switching, changing from one conversation to another, um, and all the capabilities that we've talked about over the months and years about collective superintelligence. Anyway, just wanted to put that on the table, as promised earlier, and Silas has his hand up. Go for it, Silas. Yeah, I want to um, bring back what, I, what I've always been saying about uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Gandhi's movement, and how he created something cohesive in the movement was by asking people to do one thing. Every one of us, can we all please change our clothes? That was his, his way of getting the British out of India, getting everybody to do one thing. And um, so I'm saying that, that it is the same thing that's going to work now, which is getting everybody to at least change what you eat. I don't care what else you want to focus on, focus on other things, but you can change what you eat and focus on other things. So this is, this is not a either or, it's both. You can do both, right? So that was actually his message too to the people of India. So just do that, do change your clothes and then go do whatever else you want to do. Go uh, protest, go uh, um, write petitions, whatever your activism is, that's not a problem, but change your clothes first. In the same way, what we are saying is go vegan and then do whatever else you want to do because you can do both. And because only by going vegan, only by uh, concentrating our efforts in that direction and making sure that we are all going in the same direction, are we going to bring down this corporate structure that is destroying the planet? It changes the entire foundation of the system of normalized violence and demands that you, you look at everything from a nonviolent perspective. So that, um, so I even wrote a, um, an article for the book that we are compiling, 
the book that we are compiling is called animal agriculture is immoral and um, the article i wrote is that is about non vegan fragility and dietary racism so the idea is that by eating animal foods or by consuming animal products we are actually being racist we are actually being colonialist we are actually being you know speciesist and sexist and ableist you can name it it's there it's there in the consumption itself the act of consumption does that and so once we recognize that and we all don't want to be racist then it's imperative that we take that first step which is fairly easy to do so that is the thrust of my message in fact i've been um i rejoined my uh alma mater's whatsapp group because they they wouldn't listen to me in, initially and now they are all talking about racism and i'm saying hello how about this foundation of racism right foundation of speciesism foundation of sexism which is what you eat and now they're paying some attention because they are saying yeah you know we need to talk about everything so and as engineers i think we all have to do that anyway over thank you very much i also have to leave uh, early today because i'm taking care of kimaya and i have to give her food in a parallel universe where the coronavirus didn't mutate you're in toronto with kimaya <laughs> hey and yesterday right so <laughs> virtual a uh, multi-dimensional hug <laughs> thank you thank you all <laughs> and so i should watch on the same wavelength wavelength because that's what i want to talk about because i started watching the um video between uh jane bless mitchell and uh milton mills talking mm -hmm. about uh food and racism right uh right. so right. and so you touched on a lot of the point i didn't watch the whole video but uh it really really moved me right you know um you know talking in what they were saying and then you know uh, i mean i kind of like heard that in the past and thought about it but just you know in, in light of everything like it really just sort of registered it, it to me right about how um how uh you know like you said you know types of food that you eat is, is racist and, and how um right you know we um we, we force like you know or for forcing them to to eat this food you know because they rely on government for you know whatever um whatever assistance right you know so we keep right. them in this perpetual state of sickness and whatever and you know and, and then they were talking about like you know sort of like cultural foods right you know that they hung on to but it's but um milton was was saying like it's actually the, the if you go and look at the actual cultural food that they're saying it's actually vegan right so like this you know he was talking about soul food for example right that's not real african soul food the you know the, the oxtail and the whatever you know right. and in that right. and they want to protest what's going on through the food that they eat they would not eat the oxtail and the pig's feet and all the stuff because that was what slaves ate right you know that they've adapted it to soul food but real soul food is vegan Mm -hmm. right and there is a reason why you know the white supremacists go around drinking milk to show they are superior right uh, because they are pointing out that people of color cannot digest this and and it's true they cannot digest it and they are falling sick in fact there was a video of uh, muhammad ali he said clearly associating milk with diarrhea you know it says every time i drink milk i get diarrhea so if i go to heaven will i only get milk and honey is that what you was that was what you was asking <laughs> so do they have toilets in heaven so i can get take care of my diarrhea so yeah i mean these are stories we tell you know but uh, but uh, i think we need to focus focus on on getting a vegan world right um and and all of the infrastructure that needs to go with a vegan world so that's going to be our next six, 
this is our project, right? This is what we have been working on. And um, getting more momentum for that, getting the story uh, um, not only understood by people, but also supported by people so that we get more and more people helping us get to a vegan world. Right? And uh, um, I think the, the, the others will take care of itself, you know, when you do that. The seven core shifts that we talk about, right? The seven core shifts. Uh, that should be the foundation of what we are doing. In fact, I was telling Ray, and I was looking at the uh, sustainable development goals of the UN. And the Vegan World 2026 project addresses all of them except for one goal. And I think that goal is put in there to make sure that none of the goals can be met. And that goal is the goal of economic growth. So, so I don't know why the UN would, you know, would say that, yeah, we need zero hunger, no zero poverty, et cetera, but always have economic growth. How can you guarantee economic growth, constant economic growth on a finite planet? I don't understand why they would even put something like that in there, except if it is done deliberately to make sure that we don't meet the other goals. So our SDG 17 has become SDG 16, so the 16. And then it goes into a nice four by four array, <laughs> sort of the six by three that they put. Anyway, thank you all for this forum. Thank you, Jamin. Oh, absolutely. Thing. Thank you, Silas. Yeah. Thank you all. And I guess uh, today uh, I'm going to leave early so I can go feed my granddaughter. Sounds good. Okay. Give her our best and enjoy. So let's say a quick question. Have you heard anything about uh, Endgame 50, 2050? The documentary uh, just released. Yeah, what do you mean? Uh, I have been talking to the producer. Is that what you mean? Uh, it just released on YouTube, I believe. Right. Yeah, I watched it and I spoke to the producer. And so that's how this whole idea of New Game 2050 started. So uh, yeah. the docuseries. Okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah, the docuseries that we're working on. Yeah. Jamie, you should be outraged. You went from uh, Solutions Club at the end of the universe to... Solutions Club at the beginning of the new world. They stole your your skit, your shtick. Oh, they, they stole which shtick? The uh, uh, wasn't your Solutions Club at the beginning of the new world previously the, at the end of the universe or at the end of the world or something? Before like that? it was called the Social Club at the end of the world. Right. And then Silas inspired me to change it to Solution Club at the beginning. Well, social first the Social Club at the beginning of the new world and then finally Solution Club at the beginning. Right, yeah. Yeah, so the documentary Endgame 2050, it looks at um, the 2050 from a very dystopian perspective that we don't do anything and, you know, and we have, we can hardly breathe, we can hardly eat. So that's the situation that she's imagining in the year 2050. And then she talks about why that situation is going to happen because of what's happening now. And so I contacted her and I said, you know, can we work on something, a, a positive vision for what could be? And so that started this whole process of uh, um, Nivi Jaswal getting involved and her bringing in uh, um, Wendy Sachs. And so we are imagining now a docuseries in which uh, Kimaya at the age of 40 is looking back from 2050 and saying, you know, this is really what happened in Vegan World 2026. This is what we did. And this is why we are in a thriving world now, right? So imagining a thriving world and then imagining what are all the things that happened? What are all the things that we implemented to make it happen? Okay, so, so it pings back and forth between uh, her at the age of 40 and the hair at the age of 10. I'm not even 40 yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm barely even 10. 
but, I know. You, have, but you have the wisdom of a 60 year old. <laughs> he says you have the wisdom of a 60 year old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so anyway, guys, thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Uh, we need the Bye, wisdom Maya. of a 10 year old. <laughs> we do. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Awesome. You're supposed to be in Toronto today. He says he was supposed to be in Toronto today, actually. Mm-hmm. They are in Toronto. We're, so, we're, we're sad that you're not here with us, but we'll one day very soon, I'm sure. Previously, we were going to take, we were going to fly to New York and then drive to Toronto. <laughs> so what? We were going to give talks to people. Well, why can't we just do that? Well, <laughs> that's COVID-19. Oh, come on! <laughs> Okay. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Wow. What a world we've inherited, huh? My goodness. Um you know. I kind of, um, I, I really appreciate what Silas said. I thought it was a beautiful answer to my question. And I kind of live in, in both universes where I, I believe there should be a central focus and something we can all reach consensus around. And then on the other bookend, let a gazillion flowers bloom. Everyone's going to focus on what, on what they want to focus on anyway. Why don't we leverage that, um, you know, apparently divergent phenom to our advantage by um, making it so that basically the collective superintelligence platform plus community plus culture plus rule set plus underlying sociocracy plus 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 right that all of that becomes a scenario where you get to be the ultimate kid in a candy shop because all conversations, all movements, all everything is available. So, you know, um, what do you do when you first inherit a candy shop? You stuff your mouth full and then you go puke. And then you get mature, you get some maturity. So after, so I think there will be, you know, for lack of a better word, as, as we say in Canada, a drink until you puke phase. And then um, after which people will then start eating healthy. And, you know, I I get colorful with my analogies and metaphors, but what I'm really saying is if we not just allow, but encourage this max out on your freedom and go wherever you want, that through the evolutionary process, through the process of communication and people speaking their mind and speaking their passion and all that, there will be kind of like this invisible hand that will guide us towards, you know, veganism and SRM and defunding police and, you know, raising the floor and all these good things that we've been yearning for for so long. Maybe we need, um, as, an analog- and as an analogy to the Adam Smith invisible hand of economics, maybe we need a different kind of invisible hand over radical whole system transformation, including transformation of humanity herself as a species, right? And whereas in Adam Smith's world, you know, a free market system was that which created the invisible hand. Not that I agree with any of that, but in, but just as an analogy, because it's powerful. And in our system, maybe it's this maximization of freedom of choice as opposed to economic freedom, freedom of choice in terms of go wherever you want conversationally, meet with whoever you want, right? Fulfill your wildest intellectual fantasies, right? Um, In terms of, you know, jumping into whatever conversations you want, participating fully, being heard, being expressed, being contributed to by others, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's almost like only once, once we have that freedom, you know, and that facility and that free marketplace of ideas and conversations, will we really reach our true potential? It's kind of like, you know, imagining a young Brazilian boy growing up in the most violent favela, right in the middle of the most violent gang family and just immediately growing up as part of the gang, first running drugs and then lighting firecrackers when the police come to send signals and, you know, doing the kinds of things that 
the little kids do in the Brazilian gangs. And he just grows up in that world. What he really needs in order to really be a fulfilled and expressed and, you know, awesome human being is to grow up in a much healthier environment. So what if, okay, better late than never, let's create that environment for all of humanity now, at least in the Zoomosphere, right? So regardless of what neighborhood you live in, you can plug in here. And regardless of the color of your skin and anything about that, as long as you've got internet access, and I know that's a big if, because again, the, a lot of poor Brazilian kids don't, but increasingly people do. So anyway, but I'm gonna leave that one for the moment. Everyone who has internet access can come in and really you know, fulfill their wildest dreams intellectually and psychically through this amazing medium. Maybe that's the, the freedom, the market freedom <laughs> that we've always, that we haven't never really had. And now with the Zoomosphere, at least we have the potential for it. We still have a ways to go to actually build it out and build all the infrastructure and culture and you know, community and community of communities and all that good stuff. But anyway, I'm just kind of putting it out there as you know, potentially one of those missing ingredients alongside veganism as to, hey, we need this. And then everything will start to become cool. It's like we're searching for that proverbial first domino to kick over. Silas says it's veganism, right? Um, I agree. And <laughs> I think it's, you know, collective super intelligence. And I think that, you know, a healthy uh, focus on SRM is also in order. So, you know, and that's what makes me go multiverse, multi topic, and just says, hey, look, Jamin, instead of trying to turn everybody into a, you know, a vegan with an aluminum hat and you know a neurolink plugged into their forehead that symbolizing veganism and srm and csi instead of trying to make everyone that just let every let a gazillion flowers bloom and only focus on creating that space where that can happen and everyone can gravitate to where they want to go not where you want them to go but then <laughs> my secret plan is that everyone will ultimately gravitate towards where i want them to go because i'm right right but I, I i don't but i suppose i'm not the only human being who has that perspective right i'm right listen you know anyway with that i'm going to go on mute and uh, let somebody else be right for a while <laughs> well, yeah you're right the uh and we see it in a lot of the uh, environmental movement where there isn't room for more than one answer. You know, they have this, we, we need a green energy grid and that's the way we save the world, period, full stop. Anybody got any else to say? Don't want to listen to it because, you know, that's stealing from our, our platform and our, um, you know, funding. <laughs> they ever, there's only so much philanthropic money to go around. So we have to make sure that our, agenda is front and foremost and there's nothing more capitalistic than that it's it's like you know altruism infected with capitalism and then it all of a sudden it's it's just like a you know people fighting for supremacy of you know controlling that microphone on the uh on the earth day march right can we let the vegans on stage no, no they don't have anything to say they, they've just got their weird little agenda weird little agenda that you know Salash's so white paper says it's the number one cause of, of climate change. Discuss it. At least talk about it. I mean, they, just because they don't have a solution for it, they go, well, change animal agriculture, I don't even know where to start. Because you don't know where to start does not mean that we don't do it. And because you've got control of the microphone, there's a huge problem with, uh, you know, being recognized as the heroes of, of climate change when you're slowing things down, when you can't allow for a multifaceted approach. That's why Basecamp has 26 study groups, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't turn into 80 study groups, because each group has the ability to like find at least five topics that they could turn into a task force and start knocking down these walls that keep us from a vegan world. But we can't have like just one. <laughs> one doesn't, isn't going to get us there. We have to have all the solutions in all, all facets of society working at the same time. And uh, there's um, kind of been a recent development where we've had all study groups, I said 26 different study groups, uh, all in base camp, all basically just the same thing. There is study group. But we're dividing them now into, uh, into sectors, so to speak, into um, work groups. 
which is uh, part of what Celeste had proposed is the IEEE model of uh, engaging with problems, breaking it down into pieces, people going into their groups and solving it. And they get together in work groups. So there's different kind of categories of, of uh, the problem to be broken down. So now there's going to be five different, uh, almost five different collective intelligences that will be focused on um, justice, the economy, nature, uh, food, and what was the other one? Help me out here. <laughs> Let's pull up the graphic. Spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's still a few, few spiritual people left on this planet and not everybody's gotten completely jaded and they're looking for that uh, that guidance and a lot of people are looking to organize religion and they're willing to follow any leader that uh, is willing to lead so we have to find those people and uh, they've all got it written down that they have to take care of this this uh, ball of mud so <laughs> let's uh, lead the leaders to uh, some of the solutions. Wow, wow, really good stuff, Ray. That, that really helps um, just hearing your perspectives on it and, you know, being, uh, you know, the main person behind uh, Basecamp uh, and administering all that. It, it's really just really great to hear that, that perspective. Um, and, you know, in terms of a collective superintelligence, uh, you know, platform to facilitate that, imagine, you know, a, almost like a base camp for the world, right? Um, that is, for me, mainly focused on these video conference conversations, because this is where we really hash stuff out, right? And, um, you know, where an Emery and a James can, in a few minutes, figure out, you know, what do they agree on and what do they disagree on? And, okay, and let's focus on that and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so, I mean, for our collective brain to work, we need really good synaptic connections between each other. And for me, a healthy and a powerful conversational domain is really the key for that, a network of conversations that's just hyper-connected with total transparency, you know, an advanced search that would make Google look like an abacus um, and, you know, really help us get hyper-connected. We're just beckoning to get connected. Look at how rich it is and how fortunate it is that we've all been able to come together and think of how kind of random and fortuitous that is. And, you know, of course, I, I, I thank the angels every day for helping me guide me to you all right and i'm saying you know yes we can continue to leave it up to the angels but we can also help ourselves by you know building out the infrastructure for this and if you want to consider that as helping the angels to do their job better great you know but i think it's kind of obvious we need to do this um and uh so anyway i'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that you know dreaming into um this um, future collective superintelligence. I'm reminded of the Who song from 1975. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. There's a chorus that I'm not going to try to sing at the same time. But anyway, it's from the Who by Numbers. Dreaming from the Waste, I think, is the name of the song. Anyway, um, with that, I'll go on mute and love to hear everyone's thoughts. And welcome Danny, uh, who just joined us. Um, feel free to say hello or not. It's totally cool to just hang out as well. We are recording. And Hi, sorry. Sorry, I got here so late. No, no problem. No problem. So. You're Thank fine. you. They're I missed everything you said up until now. <laughs> no, no problem, Danny. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, everyone's welcome and in fact encouraged to come and go as you please. So there is no sorry. There's no apologizing. It's all good. You're right and perfect however and whenever you are. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
All right, so with that, I'll go on mute and would love to hear others' perspectives. We're talking about collective intelligence, Danny, and the, the dream, the vision, the possibility of collective super intelligence evolving to a place where, I mean, it's just, it's just such a different reality than the one we have today where our access yeah. you know, to, to information and to people is in many ways so limited. I mean, so much of the limitations are cultural. You know, when you come to a meeting, this is expected. This is how you be professional. You have a goal. It's usually around money. And, you know, <laughs> you get together and you do that. You know, here we're talking about something so radically different. Um, and, you know, this is something that I, I've been dreaming of for years and working toward for years. And nothing has given it the shot in the arm uh, that it needs more than uh, COVID-19. And the fact that everyone's been grounded uh, and on the Zoomosphere, right? So it's created a loosely, a very loosely connected network of conversations. And so from a very simple perspective, we simply need to increase the connectivity between these conversations so that people can eat more easily discover conversations and plug into them, right? Uh, as opposed to relying on, you know, whatever means exist today for finding conversations and finding community. Anyway, um, that's what we're talking about. And I'll, with that, I'll go on mute. Love to hear others, other people's thoughts, including yours, Danny, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, if it's all right with you guys, I'd just like to um, listen so I can catch up a little bit. Oh, yeah. And I'll, yeah, yeah. And, I'll and, raise my hand here and there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in case I haven't made it clear, there, one of the rules here on the Solution Club, one of the very few rules, is that no one is ever required to speak ever <laughs> not even a single word. no seriously it's totally fine okay. to come here and hang out so okay cool freedom of speech for me includes freedom from speech <laughs> <laughs> so, ab okay. absolutely welcome danny thank you thank you mm -hmm. all right i'll go on mute and no one's in the queue so just jump in whoever feels like it do you re you remember the days of the rotary telephone I miss those days. I miss it. It made it so it made it so tactile and almost like a meditation, a mini meditation. And then the anticipation and wow. <laughs> and the fact that it was analog and not digital, you know, anyway. If there's people with a lot of nines in their phone number, they had to be really worth it to call them because you had to. Uh, uh, <laughs> But I mean, you've really felt connected in those days, no? Right? The perception that you had with that technology was, wow, I'm, I'm connected. I could, I could call my bro any, 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 any minute of the day or my friend. You know, the, the sense of connection, right, with that, with that tool, the, the, the phone, the the rotary phone. And now look where we are, you know, with all the developments, right? I mean, we're on the thresh threshold of something quite extraordinary, you know? And uh, I think with the extraordinary moments, okay, with extraordinary changes uh, come uh, very high prospects of, um, you know, beautiful things. I think, I think, I think we're on the verge. I think we're on the verge of mir miraculous things. Just think about the, the different attitude that we had towards phones when there was only one in the house. Now you have like, everybody's got their own phone. Plus, you know, a bunch of wireless phones connected to the landline. Uh, back then, the phone rang. Everybody ran for it. <laughs> Who could get there first? Now the phone, we've got a landline. It's got an answer machine, and we check it every couple of weeks. <laughs> and then you had the party line. Remember the party lines? People Still a few members them. of the family that haven't realized that we don't actually answer the, that phone. you got to call us on ourselves. Well, 
but it's uh, one of those cultural shifts that uh, we say that we never change. We can see the, the change drifting in many different ways and sometimes it uh, drifts very fast. But, but you know, it, we, we went through, we've gone through stages, right? Where, you know, at, at a certain point you would rush to answer that phone. You remember? Remember the days you rush, you, you run for the phone, and then, and then, like, as time goes by, you know, you start, oh, no, I'm not going to answer that. You know, like, we've been programmed, though, all, over the years to answer the call, answer that call, right? But I see that a lot of people, you know, have changed, you know, over the years to where they're not answering the call. They're just constantly connected. You know, you know what I mean? You never get disconnected. It's like plugged in permanently. People are plugged in permanently. Yes. the days of having only one screen at a time. Oh yeah, I got, I got one, two, three, four, <laughs> four, five. I got five screens over here, you know. In Back to the Future, when Michael J. Fox's character accidentally lets it slip that he has two TVs in his house. <laughs> in the 50s, they're going, yeah, he's joking. He doesn't have two TVs. Nobody has two TVs. Yeah. Now, we have, now we're pretty much walking around with the TV, walking down the street. Uh, now, now, I, now, now that I turned sixty-five, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get my pension, right? So I'll have a little, just a little bit more financial, financial uh, access. Maybe I'll get myself a, a real computer. Because out of five screens, I got one. I think, you know, one of them is working. Uh, it's also one with that one with Windows 10, two with seven XP. And there's somebody, that, there's somebody that's done uh, outreach on the sidewalk. It's the cell phones are one thing, but the earbuds are another. That's a, a, a you know a way that our societies tune themselves out. Even if you could talk to somebody on the street, they're not going to hear you because they got earbuds in. So I was trying to get uh, signatures on a petition for Al Gore. It's one of the favors for doing his uh, his tra training. And uh, in Toronto, it's a very multicultural community, and, and there's people who are one of the equivalent of Times Square in Toronto. And people walking by and they, you know, you can't even get their attention. And when you do get their attention, things like climate change are so far from their, their world of, of, uh, of caring. And, you know, you can't always tell where people are from, but you can tell when they're, if they're probably from a really hot country, or equatorial country, or places that are, that are attached to a desert. And you'd think that there'd be a lot more concern I mean, they're in Canada, so you know Canada's kind of associated with a place that uh, that has you know cold winters and could benefit from a bit of global warming. Goes the joke. Nobody benefits from erratic weather that you know you can't predict, and, and farmers have to throw out their almanac. That's never any, any no country is going to benefit from that. But uh, I think that come to Canada, we. We're not to, in a desert, so it's not a big concern. We're on the Great Lakes, so is there concern for water shortages? It's kind of hard to talk to people about it. When you're on the Great Lakes system, you go, there's plenty of water. There's always more. You're, you're in Toronto? food comes from California. You're in Toronto, right? Yeah. You're in Montreal? I'm in Montreal, but I, I lived in the Niagara Peninsula till uh, I was 17. So uh, I, I, I was in the region. I've been to Toronto many times. 
But you know, back, uh, I don't know, say, when did I go? I, at some point there, uh, early 2000s there, I was thinking to go down to Toronto and open up a studio down there. And I drove down and uh, I was there for a day. I said, uh, I, I can't take it. I can't take, I, I, I just can't, I just can't do it. I came back to Montreal. Where were you, you standing know, at the moment when you decided you couldn't do it? Well, I mean, I mean, I was looking around, looking around, meeting some people, right? Uh, just, uh, just feeling the territory, right? And uh, they, they, their day starts at around 11, about 10.30. By the time they get into work, by the time they get into their studio, it's like they leave early, early. But it doesn't start. Things don't get moving until uh, around 10, 30, 11. And then can't park nowhere. And then early day, if you want to get home at all, right? So I couldn't. I, I spent like half a day there. I headed back to Montreal, you know. I don't know if you've been to Montreal, but Montreal is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'll die here. Everywhere we go with Kelly, she falls in love with that place. So we went to Montreal this year and she's ready to move in. However, I have a I have a friend in Jamaica. He wants me to go down visit, you know, but uh, I don't know. I, that's expensive. What kind of studio? What kind of work do you do? Staying less. Wow. But not, 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 don't do anything right now. As, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm retired now. And sick. Well, you do say better. How big are the pieces that you work on? Oh man, well, pretty large, pretty, pretty major. You know, I did some major, major stuff. You know, churches and mausoleums and you know, all, all kinds of all kinds of residentials. You name it, I can do it, but not so much now. Been done. It's a wrap, unless you got some major job down there. I saw I saw some of uh, Emery's work. He showed us some images of his work there last last week, and uh, it's absolutely amazing, amazing work all together, like stunning. Thanks, James. Yeah, really, really beautiful. Just incredible quality and detail. Danny, I'm gonna mute you because we're getting some feedback from you. Uh, feel free to unmute whenever you want to share. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, and of course, you know, art is such a big part of our culture and how we communicate and everything. And it's just, everything is just evolving so quickly right now. It's like, um, sometimes I even just like laugh at myself for wanting to have any influence over the course of history, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm like a little mosquito, you know, on top of a piece of wood that's floating towards the edge of Niagara Falls saying, me, me, I've got an idea. We could do this. Ah, you know, it's just like, <laughs> but anyway, but I mean, <laughs> we are who we are and we have to try. That's just who we are. Have you ever been in a room, a bedroom in particular, trying to sleep with one mosquito? One mosquito. Think of think of the biomass of a mosquito compared to you, and they could drive you crazy. <laughs> so, don't give up. The <laughs> mosquitoes are uh, powerful creatures. That buzzing sound is just horrifying. They hear, they <laughs> Might not hear it out here, but it gets right there. Yeah, so vi viva la mosquito, you know, in terms of its its power to <laughs> influence and orchestrate, we of course want to become benevolent mosquitoes. Um, but, uh, 
Go ahead. Have you heard of Manitoba? Uh, the, it's the it's the what of Manitoba? The provincial bird. <laughs> the mosquito. Yeah. It's well, the, did you know? Did you know that the the DARPA or whatever they got they got drones the size of mosquitoes? Well, that's that's reassuring. Anyway, in ter in terms of our nature, I want to recite this quick little poem from. Uh, the book Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut, which goes, uh, T Tiger got to hunt, bird got to fly, man got to sit and wonder why, why, why. Tiger got to rest, bird got to land, man got to tell himself he understand. Once again, tiger got to hunt, bird got to fly, man got to sit and wonder why, why, why. Tiger got to rest, bird got to land, man got to tell himself he understand. So it goes. Yeah, we're standing under. Danny just announced that she loves Montreal and she's ready to announce her citizenship. <laughs> citizenship from? Whereabouts are you, you uh, renouncing your citizenship? I'm in um, Georgia in the U.S. Um, I grew up in New York and then I left in 05 and went to Colorado for about 13 years. And then got divorced and came down here in 2018. I have a brother and his family down here. But I'm, um, today is election day, primary day. And Georgia is one of the worst states in the union as far as voter suppression. So I'm a little sidetracked by that today because it's just more of the same. It's, it's, it's an immense dark forest that we are fighting. Be it the shadow of humanity or <laughs> that we're being confronted with but it is such a destructive, it's, it's to me, it's just evil that we're dealing with. That's just coming at every, you know, from every direction. It's just so oppressive. So I'm really, um, I'm really lucky to be in a group with you guys. I, I have to say that, you know, people who want to um, kind of help shift the experience because we can't be at war with our shadow, right? So we have to like learn to evolve um, one person at a time to reprioritize and you know go forward in in a in a different way. Uh, and I think that you know groups like this were you know were so necessary to help bring others to their own evolution because the, 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 the path of destruction is just, I mean, so many aspects are pointless. So, um, so anyway, so thanks for having me here, guys. It is a pleasure, Danny. You're welcome sticky, here. Sticky old mosquito ridden Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Joke about mosquitoes. I, <laughs> it's a good thing you muted me because I was pretty much at you. It's it's a force out here, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, you're I was in while I was in, uh, in Toronto, so I don't know if I'd be able to be as to rein in my speciesism if I was back in Manitoba. Mosquitoes are much more much more relentless. And Danny, I just wanted to say you are absolutely welcome here all the time, anytime, and feel free to come and go. That's another part of these meetings is that total freedom and just uh, also total safety um, to explore and and be honored and heard and uh, etc. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Danny. So you're having some kind of elections down there? Is that what you what you said? Yeah, it's our primaries. Okay. Yeah, for for um, the Democratic Party. Right. Okay. 
where it, it used to be a choice and now it's not really because the party pretty much chose you, chose for you. So it's really kind of, um, well, I mean, down ballot, I couldn't tell you. I don't, I don't I'm not that active, but, um, you know, as far as the presidential stuff goes, it's really no choice at all. So do you have to prove, um, you have to prove that you're a citizen or, uh, or how does it work now? Have they made the changes yet to um, the voting, to the voting process, or does anybody just with a driver's permit? Uh, you register ahead of time. You provide identification. Register. That means you should show up at on on the poll log or register. Right. And then when you get down there, you just confirm with an ID. But um, there's been issues with um, the machines, the lines at the spots, um, the shrinking polling area population, um, the, what do I want to say, the movement to counter any provable handmark paper ballot effort. A lot of people, I was one um, we chose you know a couple of months ago to do absentee ballots because of covid but the state itself is very heavily republican and they're just you know full-blown voter suppression in, in however they can do it so there's all kinds of horrible reports coming in people you know staying online for four hours getting up to one machine machines breaking down you know so this COVID is having a big, big impact. You feel, uh, you feel by the time uh, the, the May, the main election uh, was going to be in no, November, I guess, right? Gonna, you think, uh, you think it'll be a big impact, or, uh, or, you know, are they going? The, what do you? What? How do you feel? The about, forces that we're dealing with are. The, the Republican Party has a history of voter suppression, period. So um, the, the more they can suppress the turnout, the better it is for them. So that, that machine's been in operation for years. And um, they're using COVID as an excuse to further suppress in whatever way they can by putting out propaganda that handmarked paper ballots don't work, which the president uses, the head of the DOJ, the attorney general uses, plenty of people in the administration use paper ballots. And they're saying, oh no, it's, you know, just putting out negative propaganda. And then at the same time, screwing us with bad machinery and hackable machinery. So who's advocating for, uh, for handmarked ballots? Could you say that one more time, dear? Who is who is uh, who, who who is for the uh, use of hand hand marked ballots? The who, citizens. No, no, but are they? The, you were saying Republican side or Democrats? No, the Democrats are are in favor of it. They they're trying to roll it out. Okay. But by the same token, they're no. not they're not really pushing for. Um, funding for voter security no, and um no so it's you know listen it's one party it's one party with two different faces that's an, it's just an issue we have here that makes sense yeah well good luck god bless america Well, we still do the um, hand uh, written ballot and uh, counting of those individual ballots is, are, uh, are done and uh, they're overseen in public view when they're being counted and everything else in the public hall and, uh, and all that. It's all monitored, covered properly. Um, and they tried to bring in the computers about oh, one or two elections ago 
they even paid about 80 million euros for the computers but um again when they went away and bought them before they even told the people so they should have uh, kind of told the people about that one first because we just said uh no simple and plain we'll all vote our, our vote is an individual right and when we do our vote we put our vote down on paper and we see that it goes to the count and that the vote counts are counted the votes are counted and if there's an issue with the count they'll be recounted it doesn't matter how long it takes as long as it's done fairly and that's the only way to do it fairly because computers can be manipulated uh, and we said, go fuck yourselves. Sorry you spent 80 million pe uh, euros on uh, computers. Put them in the warehouse with the water pumps and meters because we're not fucking using them. Simple as that. So, sorry about the language. But basically, you know, computers, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't be 100%. You can't even be 50% sure that a computer isn't being manipulated. But you can make sure that your ballot is, you know, that you put it down on paper and that it's going to be counted. That's the main way to do it. And it's the right way to do it. And it should, and be, what, it should be what's on the ballot, what the person voted for, that should be counted. And that the majority rules, that's the way it goes. And I, I don't know what way you do it over there, but, uh, you know, the ballot and the vote, the people vote. And yet these college electoral votes seem to have won it the last time around. I don't understand that when, when the majority of people voted the other way, but that's the way you do it. It's a strange way system as far as I'm concerned, but I definitely don't agree with the computers. Well, I'm with you there. I'm going to have to get going. Y'all are welcome to hang out as long as you want, so just feel free to hang. Um, I'm going to stop recording here. Um,